Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. My pleasure as a pastor here at Redeemer. Good to be here with us this morning. Gathering we are to worship the Lord together. We've entered the sanctuary. We will worship the Lord. Hopefully that made its way into your hands. If you don't have one, I'll raise your hand. One of our ushers will make sure that you have one of these folders that we may do so. We have friendship folders. There are a few registers. They're on the inside of each of you. If you graciously take one of these, uh, fill out your information, pass it down. It helps us to know the time with us. Perhaps you're here for the very first time. We certainly give you a special welcome. We'd love to know of your time with us. We'll make a record of it in our pew register. On the back page of the worship folder, uh, there are some announcements that I would bring to your attention. One has to do with our men's uh, ministry. Uh, we meet on Monday morning for Bible study, and I would continue to hold out uh, the invitation to, to any any man who's affiliated with our church in any way to come Monday morning, 7 o'clock, right down the hallway at the fellowship hall. Hot cup of coffee and the Word of God. And uh, we'd love to have if you join us. Of course, next Sunday, as I announced the last Sunday, it's going to be next Sunday on the 14th of August, that we are going to have our uh, church uh, fellowship lunch right after the service. So if you're new and, and didn't participate the last time we had it, uh, you just come and bring food for your family. The church provides fried chicken and drinks. And so we would uh, love to, to have all of you. We just go right next door to the Redeemer House. Right after the service, uh, we enjoy a time of lunch and fellowship. And this is really an opportunity uh, for us to get to know each other better. There's somebody in the church that uh, you don't know all that well, but what you do is you strategically seat yourself at their table. And then you eat fried chicken and potato salad and you get to know the people much better. So that's kind of uh, one of the reasons why we want to have these types of things. Well, we are before the Lord this morning. Let us uh, look to Him during this prelude that our hearts might be prepared to worship Him. Creatures and the elders, in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. 
four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us pray. Father, as we have gathered ourselves in this quaint sanctuary here this morning in Valdosta, Georgia, we are reminded in what we read in Revelation 5 that in the heavenly places where you are seated in all of your glory, there is great and exciting and exuberant worship going on in your presence. As people that are called the elders are proclaiming amen and falling down before you in worship. And so, Father, we desire to do likewise this morning in your presence and our hearts and minds to fall before you in worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Please remain standing and you'll find the words to the first two songs printed in your worship folder. We'll begin by singing, Arise, My Soul, Arise. <laughs> Yeah. 
I read that second stanza, we just sang, when Satan tempts me to despair, tells me of the guilt within, of where I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. This is our experience with God through Jesus Christ. We continue to struggle with sin, but we have Christ. We have a Savior. We die. So as believers in Christ gather this morning in the presence of a God who is holy, 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 when we think of our sin, we know what we should do with it, right? Not try to justify it, not try to rationalize it, not try to push it under the proverbial carpet. We need to confess it to God, turn from it, receive this great pardon that is on us. So I'm going to lead us in prayer. We'll have the opportunity to do so. Join with me. Father, we sing of the throne that is at your throne in the heavenly places, a place where at your right side is seated our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one whom you sent into this world. Born of a woman, born under the law, that he might save us from the curse of our law breaking, that he might bleed and die on a cross in our place, that we might actually, truly, and eternally be forgiven of our sins. So, Father, as those who are honest about our sinful ways, our thoughts, our words, and our actions, we come before you now in a spirit of repentance and godly sorrow. And in the quiet of our hearts, each of us now confess our sins. Father, as we have humbly asked to be but this one thing, pardon us, forgive us, remembering the words that we just sang. You do so because you look not upon us and our sin, but you look upon your Son, for He is our advocate and our great high priest. And because of Him, we receive forgiveness. We pray in Jesus. Assurance of pardon that you'll find printed in your folder this morning is drawn from Isaiah chapter 44 where God says this to us about how He deals with our sin. Join with me as we are reminded of this glorious truth. Join with me. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. Well, that's comforting to know that God sweeps our offenses. He takes them away from us because of Jesus Christ. As believers this morning, let's confess our faith. We're told in the Scriptures to hold fast, cling to that good profession of faith. This morning, using the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer number one, the Heidelberg Catechism begins by pretty much summing up in its first question and answer uh, the life of a believer and, and what is our experience and what is the truth about who we are. So I'll ask the question. If you please respond in unison with the answer. Question number one asks, what is your only comfort in life and death? Yeah. 
now go to prayer for our Lord, knowing that all those things are true, and we do have this relationship with God the Father through Christ. Father, as we come to you in prayer, in a spirit of worship, a spirit of joy, a spirit of praise, we are mindful of what we just recited from Heidelberg Catechism, question one. What a blessed people you have called us to be. How you have gathered us to yourself and made us to be your people, your covenant people. Very special to you we are. The scriptures make that patently clear. You have given us your blessed spirit. You have given us your son. You've given us the church and the sacraments and all the means of grace necessary to live for you, to serve you, and do your will. So, Father, it is with such great confidence in knowing that these things are true that we come to you in prayer this Lord's day, seeking your face in the name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, who has gone on before us into the heavenly places. There He is at your right hand to advocate on our behalf. Father, as we think of our time of worship this morning, set before us, obviously, is the table of your Son, Jesus Christ. We call it the Lord's table, a place of holy communion. Well, Father, as we come to it later in our service, but even now, Father, by your graciousness and mercy, prepare our hearts and minds to come in a way that is in keeping with the dignity and honor of this table. Examine our hearts, Lord. Prepare us to come in a way as well that finds us full of praise and full of joy, full of excitement, because we will be reminded again that we have been saved from our sins not of ourselves, but because of the finished work of Christ. And Jesus, you have left us here in this world to do your bidding, to be your servant, even as Paul would describe believers as ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming, making an appeal to the world that they too must believe in Christ lest they perish in their sins. And so, Father, we pray this morning for the work of your kingdom around the world, for missionaries that have gone out under the call that you placed upon their life to serve you on foreign fields this morning. We pray for our brother Frank Harrell over in Japan. What a faithful, humble servant he is in that place. Lord, bless him with strength and vitality. Bless him with encouragement from the brethren there. Lord, He asks us to pray now that He's on a new ministry location, that things would continue to go well there. He would continue to get acclimated and accommodated in His new setting. Frank always asks us to pray for the Japanese pastors, that these men would be bold in proclaiming the Gospel and teaching the Word in an incredibly secular society which is also deluded by so many false religions. Father, use Frank and the Japanese pastors and churches and other missionaries in that land to build up your kingdom in that place. Father, we pray for our church here at Redeemer. I would lift up all who are heading back to school these days, students and teachers alike, as the schools are now receiving back the students, and VSU soon will receive back its student body and we just pray Lord that you bless all of these students and, and teachers and uh, help them to get off to a wonderful start and, and prosper during this school year. Succeed in all of their learning and in all of the ways that these teachers teach these young people. Father we pray for our elders who will be meeting on tomorrow night and just ask Father for your special blessing upon these men as they gather in prayer and liberation about the affairs of this congregation. Give them a spirit of wisdom and discernment. Make them men of great faith that they might believe you, that they might trust in you, that might lead this church in a way which brings you much glory. Father, we think of those who are not well that we lift up our brother Randy Holloman to you. He has a pinched nerve which is affecting his extremities, his arms and his hands especially. We pray for relief 
for Randy from his pinched nerves. Father, we pray for our brother Paul Cowher, who is really struggling with pain in his knee. We just uh, ask, Father, that you would mercifully bring a measure of relief to the pain that he's experiencing. Father, we close our time of prayer this morning, understanding that you are the God who raises up all civil authorities, puts them in their places. We are told to pray, to pray for these. We lift up our local, our local uh, government to you this morning. We pray for our mayor. We pray for our city council here in Valdosta, for the county commission. All these that are in very strategic places of great responsibility and power. Lord, keep them humble. Keep them focused on the welfare of this community. Lead them and guide them in your ways, Father, that the judgments that they make would be righteous, they would be good, and they would be true. Father, we lift up all these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning I'm going to begin a new sermon series from the book of 1 Corinthians. And the book of 1 Corinthians, as we're going to look at the first few verses of the first chapter, uh, Paul speaks of uh, who God's people really are, how we are the called of God and blessed of God. Well, this is not something new that God would say concerning His people. Deuteronomy 7, uh, beginning in verse 6, uh, listen to what God says. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be His people his treasured possession. The Lord did not set His affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you, kept the oath He swore to your forefathers, that He brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, he is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. Let us now give to the Lord tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father, as Your people, even described in Deuteronomy, and as we'll see described in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as Your people, whom You have called to Yourself, to do Your work and to serve your purposes in this world. We know that part of that is bringing tithes and offerings into your church so that your work can be fully supported. I pray you bless that which comes forward this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
mentioned a few minutes ago this morning, I'm going to embark upon a study of the all important book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. I felt compelled to begin this study for a number of reasons. One primarily is that this book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are about the church. There's no other church that Paul planted and was involved in that has such a record about it as is the church of Corinth. So we're going to learn a lot about how to be in the church. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from the Corinthian believers. Also, when you think about it, in our day and age, the challenge is truly before us to be the church stand for the things that God has called us to. So as we study the book of 1 Corinthians, I think we'll come across so many very pertinent, very some eye-opening issues and topics that are much needed for the church to be focused on. So I invite you in your New Testament to open your Bible, find 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be looking at the first nine verses of the first chapter of this letter written by the Apostle Paul begins by saying, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in Him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. This so is the reading of this portion of God's holy and inerrant Word. Well, how does Paul begin his letter to the Corinthians? He begins his letter by addressing the issue of identity. The issue of who God's people really and truly are. Or I fear that there might be many believers today that are going through somewhat of an identity crisis, some measure of spiritual amnesia, forgetting who they really are according to God. Some are probably struggling. Maybe this is you here this morning. I don't know. Which is it? Am I who I think I am? Or am I who other people think I am? Or am I who God says I truly am as a believer? So this morning we are going to answer these questions and hopefully solve the identity crisis that someone here with us this morning perhaps is going through. And for everybody that we might be edified in knowing precisely what God says about our identity. You see, it is imperative that all believers understand and cherish how God <coughs> has impacted their life, has changed their life. You see, we have such an identity as Paul describes because God has changed our lives. He's impacted everything about us. Let me give you a brief introduction into this book of 1 Corinthians where... And what kind of city was the ancient city of Corinth? Well, it was a seaport in what we would know as modern-day Greece. It was very prosperous, but very, very debauched, very licentious. Some have even compared the city of Corinth to like the American city of New Orleans being combined with Las Vegas, throw a little bit of New York City in there, and you get Corinth. That's the kind of city that it was. It had in its midst the temple of Aphrodite, and she was the goddess of love. The goddess of love. The Romans were infatuated with their gods and goddesses. And so Aphrodite had this glorious temple. 
and a part of worshiping at the temple of Aphrodite was to make employment of one of the 1,000 prostitutes that were there. For that's, that's how you appeased Aphrodite. That's how you pleased this goddess. You committed fornication right there in the temple. It was a Roman colony, a city of probably 350,000 people. That's where this church was in the midst of that kind of city. When did Paul go there? Well, he went there around 50 A.D. on his second missionary journey. He stayed there about 18 months and was very much involved in this church. He wrote this letter that we're reading, 1 Corinthians, probably around 54 A.D. while he was in the city of Ephesus, he had heard, he had heard that there were issues, there were troubles, things were perplexing the congregation there in Corinth, and so he writes a letter, a much needed letter. He wrote because of serious issues. You see, it was a it was a large church there in Corinth, but it was a cliquish church. It had become a lazy and lackadaisical gathering of believers. Though it was a very spiritually gifted church, a pretty wealthy church, it was an undisciplined church. And Paul heard about all these realities there in the church at Corinth, and so that's why he writes this extensive letter. And where does he begin? By telling the believers in Corinth who they really are, for perhaps many of the issues that were perplexing them were because they had forgotten who they really were as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are we really as believers? Well, that's what I hope to impress upon you. First, know this, that we are those called by God, and then we're going to see that we are those blessed by God, and then finally, we will see that we are those who are protected by God. So may God reacquaint us all with who He says. We really are. You see, it's very easy for us to self-define who we are. It's very easy to let others define who we are. We really need to have our life defined by God, don't we? So let's look at the first aspect of who we really are. We are those called by God in verses 1 through 3. Three times Paul uses the words called or call, and the inference simply is that we as believers are the called ones of God. Now, what all does Paul say about our calling? Well, it begins with his explanation by way of his own testimony that we would understand the origin of our calling. Where does a calling by God into the life of a person, where does that begin? Well, Paul says, verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Who called Paul to be a believer and an apostle? Who called him? Paul says, God called me. What was the catalyst of the calling? Paul said this. Well, it was the will of God. It was the decision that God Himself made. God says, my will is that Paul will be an apostle of mine and serve me in that regard. Let me ask, you do realize, don't you, that it was an exercise of God's will that called you to Christ. If you're a believer here this morning, it was God's will, an exercise thereof, that called you unto Christ. I love what Jesus said in John 6 about this very issue of being called originally by God. Jesus said, all the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that He has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So that's where the calling that is upon our life had its origin, the will of God. And Jesus says, I've come from the Father to put into effect the will of God to call the people of God to salvation. Paul goes on and talks about the result of our calling. So if you're called by the will of God to be a believer, 
What does Paul say about the result? Well, he says in verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. The result of our calling, listen, we are the church. The church. In the Greek, that word church that we read in the English language is the word ekklesia. It means simply those who are called out of the world and called to God, gathered in. We make up the church. We are sanctified by Christ, declared to be righteous. Paul says that we are those who by the righteousness of Christ have been justified by the finished work of Christ and our faith in that work. And so we are the sanctified of God in this world. Believers, without being arrogant, without being braggadocious, can honestly say, I am righteous in the eyes of God because of the righteousness of Christ. We also have this as a result of our calling. We are called to live holy lives. Paul says it explicitly. Called to be holy. Who is the one who called us? God who is holy. So we are called to live holy lives, to reflect the one who has called us, the one who has sanctified us. Boy, 1 Peter chapter 2, the apostle Peter waxes eloquent when he says this about God's people. Listen closely. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful life. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Such is the glorious result of the will of God calling a person to Himself and saving that person, <coughs> making them to be a believer. That God's calling us to salvation in Christ has changed us to live a different kind of life once we've been called. So Paul goes on and talks about the third consideration of our calling, which has to do with unity the unity of our calling. The latter part of verse 2, he, he speaks in these terms, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. All believers everywhere are equally called of God. Listen, my friend, there's no spiritual caste system in Christianity. We're not like the Hindus. There are no prima donnas. There are no spiritual elite. And then the deplorables, you might say. No, there is only one type of called believer. We're all identical and the same in regards to how God has saved us and called us unto Himself. The Apostle Paul makes it patently clear when he writes to the Galatian church in Galatians 3. Listen and see if you conclude with me about the unity of our calling. So Paul says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So who are we? We are those called by God. All of us everywhere in the world, the visible church, all who are believers, all alike, we are called of God. Sanctified, called to live holy lives in union one with another to serve the purposes of God. That's who we are when we think initially about being called by God. I remember when I was playing Little League Baseball back in the mid-70s. I was playing in the Indian River City Little League and did quite well uh, one year. 
at least I thought I did quite well. The coaches seemed to affirm that I had done quite well. I hoped that what was being said to me was true. My dad said I had done quite well. My mom thought I had done great. I didn't know. But if you've ever played Little League, you know at the end of the season they choose what? An all-star team. Oh, boy. And I knew that the coaches were going to have this meeting. My dad said they're meeting tonight. They're meeting tonight. And they'll make calls after that meeting to the 15 guys that made the team. Well, here I am, this little 12-year-old, sitting there going, oh my gosh, am I going to get the call from the coaches to tell me I'm on the all-star team? Would I get the call? Ring-a-ling. I got the call. I made the all-star. It wasn't really necessarily my doing it. Ultimately, it had to be a decision of these coaches. But I got called. Now, God says, I have chosen you, and boy, have I called you to much more than a little league all-star team. You, you are my chosen people, as Peter says. You are my royal priesthood. You are my holy nation in this world. That's what I've called you to. And if you're a believer, you got that call. You received that call and you responded by faith to that call and you believed in Jesus Christ and you are, as Paul describes, one of God's called ones. Let's look at the second aspect that Paul describes about who we really are. For he goes on and, and describes us as those who are blessed by God in verses 4 through 7. Paul says we are blessed of God and by God in three major ways. Three major ways he describes. The first blessing of God is best understood in theological terms, theological truths things that God declares to be true about us theologically. And what Paul describes in verse 4 is the blessing of being as he describes in Christ. Verse 4, Paul says, I always thank God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. So you see, Paul is stating the theological fact, theological truth, that those who have been called of God by way of theological, indissoluble, irrefutable truth, the fact is that you are positionally in Christ. You're in Christ. You are in Christ. Now what is the meaning of this theological fact or this theological truth? that one would say, wow, the Bible says I'm in Christ. What does that actually mean? Well, Paul helps us in another one of his letters in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin. Amen. So Paul helps us to understand what it means to be in Christ and for that to be the absolute truth about us theologically. He says in Romans 8.1 to be in Christ is to not fear condemnation. My friend, if you are in Christ, you cannot be condemned by any subsequent sins that you would ever commit after having believed in Christ. The reason being is Jesus Christ was condemned for you on the cross. It means if you are in Christ that you are spiritually alive. You're spiritually now in tune with the things of God. You are a living, born again, spiritual person. To be in Christ means that sin and death no longer hold you absolutely captive. You are no longer a slave. 
to sin as you once were. These things are true about being in Christ. What a blessing! What a blessing to have no condemnation, to be spiritually alive, to not have sin and death hold you captive. But there's a second blessing that Paul describes that comes to us from God, and it's not necessarily a theological truth or theological blessing per se, but it's the blessing of knowing Jesus Christ. The blessing of knowing Jesus Christ. Follow with me. I read verse 5 again. He says, For in Him, reminding us again of that theological truth, for in Him you have been enriched in every way in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. So Paul speaks of the blessing of having what? A relationship with Jesus Christ. Our life as a called one of God. And so blessed of God. Hear me, our life is a life enriched by Jesus Christ. Everything about Jesus and His presence in our life enriches us so that when we talk and, and when we think and when we relate to people, it's influenced by Jesus Christ. It's influenced by the Spirit who abides with us. It's influenced by what we know to be true in God's Word. Paul says of himself in Galatians 2.20, personal testimony, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul described his life as not being his own, but it was an experience that he was having where he saw himself to be dead and only ever wanted to walk in the life of Christ that was His. To walk in the living presence of Christ that was His. Hear me, Christianity is not some stale theological argument. Christianity is a relationship with the true and living God through the presence of His Son in your life. That is Christianity. Paul describes the Corinthians as being those who have that blessing from God, that life in Christ. The same is true of anyone today. But there is this third blessing that Paul speaks of, which is not necessarily theologically, not so much experiential, but certainly experiential in many ways. I call it ministerial. The blessing of being gifted by Christ. For Paul does speak of gifting here, does he not? Verse 7, he says, Therefore, because all this is true, right? All these blessings, this calling, because all that's true, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. See, Paul is informing us of the blessing of having some spiritual gift from God. God has in every single one of His people, providentially, sovereignly, whatever other attribute He needed to bring to bear on His decision making, decided you will be gifted in such a way to serve me, to do my will, to bring me glory. The Apostle Paul talked about this kind of gifting in Romans 12. He said we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesied, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So such is the result of being called of God. The life that is ours. The blessed life that is ours. Theological truths are in place. 
There's the day-to-day -day experience of the life of Christ. And then on top of that, there's taking that life we have in Christ and doing something with it for the glory of Jesus. Serving Him. Reaching out to the lost. Ministering to the needy. Helping those who can't help themselves in some situation. Serving in the church. That's the blessing of God in our life. A few years ago, I had a very humbling experience on the short-term mission field. I got to go to Cuba, the island of Cuba, on five different occasions. And uh, when we were down there in Cuba, we were each assigned a translator. If you've done mission work on a foreign mission field, you're familiar with what it's like to be introduced to someone who's going to help you overcome the language barrier. I didn't speak a word of Spanish hardly, and I needed the translator that was assigned to me. As long as I live, I'll never forget Ernesto. At the time, Ernesto was 55 years old, a little bit older than me. Very humble, very gracious, very precious believer. Living the blessed life of Christ, the called life of Christ, where was he living it? On an island where you can't get off unless you want to swim with the sharks. Under the tyranny of the Castro brothers. An awful, dreadful life, economically and culturally, but Ernesto was such a wonderful encouragement to me because he was living a life that was so far above and beyond the, the misery of what it meant to be a citizen of Cuba. And I remember I would greet Ernesto when I would see him in the morning. I would say, how are you today, Ernesto? This is, this is how he would return his words every time to that question. I am so blessed to know Jesus Christ. Tell him he would answer me. Not what a bummer it was last night because they cut the electricity off in the house. Or any of the other troubles that he had in life. And boy, he had a lot of troubles. He said, I am so blessed to be in Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, Ernesto, your testimony steamrolls me. You crush me with this type of way that you live. He understood the blessing of God. Quickly, a third aspect of who we really are, as Paul makes it clear to us in these first nine verses, has to do with we are those protected by God. Oh, I love what he says in verses 8 and 9. Draw comfort from these verses. Let me read again. He, that's speaking of God, He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Paul's talking about protection. He's talking about the role of God in the life of a called one, a blessed one, is one of protecting. Who's protecting us? Well, none other than God Himself. According to Paul, none other than God Himself. Psalm 121 kind of describes what maybe we hardly ever realize is really going on when we think of God protecting us. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. That's God. And Paul is affirming that in the New Covenant. That God is the one watching over us. Protected. No, well, what is He so concerned about is God with us. The blessed called ones. What's His driving motive to say, Boy, I am absolutely categorically committed to protecting these people. There are real two objects of, of God's protection. And the first, as Paul describes, is our perseverance. 
Paul says, God will keep you strong to the end. Who in here thinks that if you believed on your own that you would ever make it to the end on your own? <laughs> Folks, we'd all flake off, we'd all shirk and retreat and give up and fold the cards and cash the chips. But according to to what we know of our God who's protecting us. He will see us through and keep us strong in our faith to the very end. And secondly, the object of God's protection is indeed our justification so that we will be, as Paul says, blameless. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing, Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 8, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. If you have believed on Christ, my friend, you have been justified by God, my friend. Your record in heaven is the righteousness of Christ, my friend. And nothing can undo that record. God is standing guard anyone would try. But thirdly, God is protecting in, in, in what manner? Well, in verse 9 it tells us by upholding something, His covenant faithfulness. His covenant faithfulness. That, that's, that's how God is, is doing it. Boy, look, look, look what Paul says. God who has called you into fellowship with His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, He is faithful. It doesn't say you folks better figure out this deal of getting real good at being faithful or you're not going to make it. No, He declares that it is God who is faithful. Paul would write to Timothy, his underling, and say if we are faithless, God will remain faithful for He cannot be. That's how God protects us. It's His person. It's His character. The God of truth and integrity and righteousness who says, I called you. I am so blessing you. And you can depend on me that I will keep my faithful covenant promise to you. So who are we? We are those, as we just saw, protected by God because we are the called of God and we are the blessed of God. And all of this was by what doing of our own? None. All the grace of God. If you're here this morning wondering, how did anyone ever have that kind of experience in life? What's well, by the grace of God and you need to believe in Christ and you too will find yourselves in a place where you had been called and blessed and now we're under the protective arm of God. Believe in Christ. That's the only way. There's not a person here this morning would dare say they worked their way into this situation. No. We all did it because God is gracious. So what do you think the church at Corinth thought after they read these opening remarks? Can you see the pastor there get the scroll out? We got this big fat letter, about nine, ten pages from Paul. Here's how he begins. And they and, and, and the pastor would have read this. I like to think they said, well, that's who I really am. Paul, blessed, protected. Perhaps that's how they responded. What are you thinking about yourself right now? As a believer. Paul? Blessed? I'll leave you with a thought about a man named Joel Osteen. You don't know who Joel Osteen is, right? He pastors the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. Over 30,000 members, the largest church attendance of any church in the United States of America, Joel Osteen. Pretty well-known guy. He's on TV all the time. You might be thinking, what in the world is a PCA pastor doing closing a sermon? <laughs> Speaking about Joel Osteen, because theologically we're, let's say, pretty much on opposite ends of the continuum. In many ways, I'm going to tell you why I'm closing by referring to Joel Osteen. There's one thing. One thing I appreciate about Joel Osteen. If you've ever seen a broadcast of one of his services from the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, at the beginning of the service he has everybody stand. He has everybody take their Bible in their right hand and he has everybody recite 
together this mantra. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And I agree with that. And that's where Joel Osteen and I kind of part ways with how he applies that. But how he begins his service is true. <laughs> we really are not who that guy down the street says we are, or that fellow at work says we are, or that person at school says we are. We are who God says we are, who the Bible says we are. Let's close it. Father, we are so encouraged as we embark upon our study of the book of 1 Corinthians at what your servant Paul says to all of God's people. And here we are, some 2,000 years later, encouraged to know who you say we are, blessed and called, protected by you. Thank you for that, Father. None of us deserve it. None of us can earn it. We all believe simply by Christ and receive everything that you have given us. So, Father, as we move forward in our service, looking to this Lord's table, prepare our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and turn in your hymnals to number 500. We'll sing Rock of Ages, Club for Me.
of your Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's who you essentially are. You're a saved one by the work of Christ. And so God has built it into His new covenant, the church, so that we would, we would not forget who we are. The truth, my friends, is about what we are to experience. We partake of these elements this morning as a believer. And you can be reminded exactly who you are and what Jesus Christ has done to make it to be who you are. As we come to the table this morning, I'm going to be reading these words of institution from the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. We'll get to this passage eventually, I assure you. They had issues and troubles around the Lord's table and were in need of this kind of instruction. And this is the instruction that every church needs as well about the Lord's table. Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So as we come to this table, let us uh, heed the word of the Apostle Paul as to how we come and actually who should come. Worshiping the Lord with us this morning, if your status is that you are a believer in Christ and believed in Christ, trusted Him alone for your salvation, i.e., you are called of God and blessed of God, this table is for you. My invitation to you as a minister of the gospel is to come and partake and be reminded of the broken body and shed blood of Christ. Do so by faith. There's nothing magic in any of these elements up here. This is an exercise of your faith that God draws near to us, believers, as we come. But if your status here this morning with us is that you cannot honestly say that I'm a believer in Christ, I've never, I've never been brought to that place. I've never really bowed before Christ, repented and turned to Him, asking for forgiveness. I'm so glad you're here. You've heard the Gospel. It's yours to believe upon, but not this table. Not yet, for you could not truly examine yourself and, and could not really discern the real spiritual import of these elements. So I ask you simply to refrain. But if you're a believer, please come to the table. Father God in heaven, we are at the foot of this place in your kingdom where you draw nigh to your people. We draw nigh to you. We are about to take unto ourselves these small, paltry elements by the world's standards. But, O oh Lord, in Your kingdom, they are of paramount value as to what they say to Your people that Jesus, the God-man, the incarnate Son of God, who had a real body and who had real blood and a real human life, gave that over in death for us and suffered Your wrath so that we, so undeserving of such grace and mercy, could be forgiven of all of our sins. We thank You for it, Father, and we set aside these elements from their common and everyday purpose to serve a holy use among us now. May they truly remind us as we take them unto ourselves that our salvation, our identity, is not in ourselves. It is all and ever shall be in the work of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. The Apostle Paul was recounted there in 1 Corinthians 11, the experience that Jesus Christ had with his disciples that night when there was a Passover meal that he was overseeing. Jesus took the unleavened bread portion of the meal, he broke it, distributed it to his disciples and told them to eat of it, that this would be a perpetual reminder of what his suffering would be like, his broken body. So let us pray.
Jesus, no doubt, was serving the Passover meal to his disciples that night. He knew full well that in order for God's people to be called to God and be blessed with salvation of God, be ever protected by God, it was going to cost him his life. Not just torture, but his life. And they were going to treat him terribly. The Romans were going to kill him. And that's what these small cups of juice would truly represent. That Jesus Christ, when he hung on that cross, the cause of his physical death, his, his physical body passing the manner in which they so beat him and pierced him with a javelin and so on that he essentially bled out. And he took a cup at that Passover meal and he said to his disciples, take this cup and drink of it, all of you. This is all about the new covenant that I'm putting into effect so there can be forgiveness of sins. He said, drink of it, all of you. And in doing so, you will proclaim my death until I come again. So let us pretend.
what you've done for us, who we are as your people in Jesus Christ. We are yours, the blessed of God. Beloved of you, your special people, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. This time we're going to receive our deacon's mercy offering an opportunity for you to contribute to our deacons that they might have resources to exercise mercy, passion, inside and outside of our congregation. Father, you have called us as your people to be ever mindful of the needy. People have crisis situations come into their lives and all kinds of experiences. And, and we're here as your people to help. I'm thankful for the generosity of this congregation and even the gifts this morning that will help our deacons to be able to help others. We pray in Jesus' name.
shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace, both now and forever. Amen.